Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Coffee and Tea with AARP, our biweekly conversation in with which AARP staff and volunteers talk to Connecticut decision makers about policies and programs that are of, a, are of interest to older residents. Uh, my name is John Erlinghauser, and I'm the Senior Director of Advocacy and Community Outreach here at AARP in Connecticut. And I'm pleased to be joined today by one of our great AARP Connecticut volunteers, Rich Bright. So thanks for being with us today, Rich. And uh, why don't you tell, before we get started with our guest, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about uh, what you do here at AARP as a volunteer and a little bit about yourself and your background? Absolutely. Hello, John. Hello, Representative Horn. Um, and thank you for inviting me. I retired about 12 years ago as a plant manager for a large fine arts reproduction printing company. And when my wife of 52 years, Pat, retired a few years later, we both joined AARP in an effort to make a difference in the community. So for the past nine years, we have served in many different capacities in community outreach programs. And uh, but one of the ones that we really enjoy the most is serving as volunteer advocates for AARP to the Connecticut State Legislature. So I'm very happy to be here today with you. Oh, and, and that's great, Rich. And you're one of, uh, you and Pat are, are a couple of our, our stalwart volunteers and you're involved in so many things. And we. Really appreciate it. So uh, with Thank that you, being said, um, it's also my pleasure to welcome State Representative Maria Horn of the 64th District. Uh, she serves as the co-chair of the Legislature's Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. Representative Horn also serves on the Energy and Technology Committee, as well as the Environment Committee. So Representative Horn, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background um, outside of the legislature, what towns you represent, anything that folks should really know about you, your district, and uh, what you do. Thanks, John. It's really nice to be with you today. So I uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have, uh, even if it's a virtual coffee and tea, um, I, 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 I will sip my tea in your honor this morning. Absolutely. So yes, I represent the Northwest Corner, the 64th District, which is nine towns, Salisbury, Sharon, Kent, Cornwall, Canaan, North Canaan, Goshen, Washington, and Norfolk. So as you can read from that list, it's a big geographic area. It's a very rural area. And as we might know later, has some some issues with broadband con con um, connectivity. So I am a lawyer by training um, and I have been involved in various. I've realized that I have worked in every branch of government and ever, I've worked in um, state, local and federal government. I've worked in the legislative branch, the judicial branch and the uh, executive branch uh, along the way. I was a federal prosecutor before I um left to, to when my, before my third child was born and um, did a lot of nonprofit work after that when my husband and I moved to the Northwest corner. Um, so I've been, you know, an observer of an, and a participant in, in government from the outside for a long time. And then I decided finally in 2018 to run for, for office because I, I had become convinced as the importance of state government in particular and how much impact it has on people's lives that I think that not everyone pays attention to. And so it's been one of my big missions to just provide a better window to the people of the Northwest Corner to what happens in state government. And so I try to make a point of doing a lot of regular communication with them just to let them know what's going on and, and how the issues will affect their lives. Right. That's that's important. And that's a lot of a lot of geography you cover in your district. Right. <laughs> I mean, people don't realize uh, some of the, you know, from my neck of the woods, how rural parts of the state are. And, um, you know, but it's it's beautiful territory. So, hey, I'm going to turn it over to Rich. Rich, why don't uh, you uh, ask uh, Representative Horner next uh, our question? Oh, OK. Just a personal comment, if I may. I love that section. My ancestors come from Cornwall and huh. um I spent many, many weekends up at the Boy Scout camp in Goshen. Uh, both my sons are Eagle Scouts up there. So I really appreciate that area. It's gorgeous up there. It's nice. But, I love the Eagle Scout ceremonies are some of my favorite local events. So yeah. yeah. Oh, I love them. Yep. <laughs> I've got a grandson that's going there too. So we're in good shape. So getting down to business. Uh, <laughs> Representative Horn, can you tell us about your role as co-chair of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee? and what that role entails, and what state legislative proposals does your committee have jurisdiction over? Sure, so I have just become chair uh, or co-chair. All committees in the legislature are, of course, joint committees. So there's a Senate chair and a, and a House chair um, of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. And it is response, it's one of two, uh, as they are uh, nicknamed, money committees, <laughs> because uh, the Finance Committee is responsible for raising 
uh, the money that we need to fund uh, government services. And the Appropriations Committee is the other half. They are the ones who decide how we spend the money uh, that we raise. And, and I am keenly aware in that responsibility that everything everything we do in the state of Connecticut, all the funds that we raise in the state of Connecticut to, to provide the many critically important services all come from other Connecticut residents. And so, you know, that responsibility of making sure we do it in a way that people understand um, what we spend our money on, that it's responsible, that it's fair, um, and that we, you know, try to take you know, as little as possible from people in order to accomplish our aims, and that the resources are going to the people who most need them, and that we can all feel engaged in that. In other words, it's not an us-them mentality. It's we can all feel proud to, you know, be part of contributing to the health and welfare of all of Connecticut citizens. So, so we are, and and you know, as the legislature, we're, we're the committees that sort of do our work towards the end of the legislative session because all of the proposals that other um, committees make that 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 involve money in any way eventually come either have to come to either finance and or appropriations and then we craft the budget so we have to tote up my job is to 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 make the numbers add up because of course we're required to balance our budget as all i think at least i believe all state governments have to do and we certainly have to do in connecticut and we've been doing a good job of that in, in recent years in terms of putting money away for a rainy day and ensuring that we have resources available should there be a downturn and, and should Connecticut's you know, economy need uh, extra resources. So, so I feel it's a weighty responsibility, I feel, and, but it's, it's really important work. So I feel very, you know, a strong sense of purpose. You know, that's that's great. It's uh, one of the important uh, committees. And, you know, you uh, just replaced uh, our new comptroller, uh, Sean Scanlon, is the House co-chair, right? And I so, did. Uh, I still that's... have his I still have his cell phone number. So I can ah, awesome. So you're wired in. <laughs> we'll know how to we'll know how to reach. Um, so that, that's great. So, you know, very important committee. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the work that, that this committee has done in, in recent years. So, you know, retirees and those approaching retirement age make up about 39% of the state's population, and yet their total uh, economic contribution to the gross state product is 44%. So it's kind of counterintuitive. People don't usually think like that when it comes to retirees. And in, in uh, recent years, the legislature leading with the finance committee uh, made some changes that are beneficial to retirees as, as it relates to kind of the taxation of retirement benefits. So do you want to, you know, want to put you on the spot, but could you talk a little bit about the changes that have occurred and, and how they're helping retirees with, uh, as it relates to. Sure. Uh, I'd be happy to income? start with my, my own personal experience. So I grew up in Ohio and I did my, my mother's taxes for many years. Um, and until I finally, after many years of convincing her, got her, convinced her to move to Connecticut to be closer to me, upon which I discovered that Connecticut taxes her retirement income. And she had a very small annuity of my father's and her social security. And so, you know, very limited resources. And, and I really felt the impact suddenly of having not only had she moved to a more expensive state, but suddenly the state was taking her resources. So I'm very proud that we have started to do something about that. And but, but it's created some issues. So we have, what we have done is essentially make, uh, you know, there are qualifying income thresholds, but, but those below certain income thresholds do not have to pay taxes on, on social security or, um, or on pension annuity funds. And that, 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 you know, factored in over time. But one of the challenges that we're dealing with at the moment is that we created, um, I think a couple of issues um, that we that we, that we are very much thinking about trying to clean up this year. One of which is is uh, you know called the the cliff. We have a lot of cliffs in um, in state government, which basically means that services are re are re you know available up until a certain point, and then suddenly they're not available at all. And that is what's part of what's happening with um, the you know non taxability of of various forms of retirement income. You know, if you once you exceed exceed the income threshold currently of Hundred thousand for a for joint filers and seventy five thousand for a single filer. Suddenly, you're not eligible at all. So uh, we are looking at various in the finance committee this year at various ways of trying to address that because it sets up just the wrong set of incentives, you know, for people and also for planning. Um, suddenly, you know, it, it just changes your whole fiscal picture if suddenly you have to pay tax when you didn't before. So one of the things we're looking at is. Um, 
is trying to, I personally am looking at trying to figure out a way to tail off that. I mean, I still think, you know, the state has limited resources and we can't change everything immediately, but, and that we should try to focus our resources on those who are most in need, but to try to maybe tail off that, that cliff so that it, it's, it's a hill instead of a cliff uh, and maybe make it gradually uh, the non-taxability fade away till such a point, you know, for somebody with a robust enough income, might, it might not be as important. Um, so we're trying to figure that one out. Yeah, I mean, Rich, you know, we, we hear from a lot of our yeah. folks, right? I mean, um, that, 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 you know, what, what are some of the things, Rich, we hear about, you know, when we, we, we talk to our folks about this issue? Yeah, you know, we're, everybody that we talk to about finance has that question, you know, why is it that way? That's terrible. They have to do something. And um, fortunately, we're very happy about all the things that have been done up to this point. And we're giving people a smile and saying they're working on it, they're aware of it, and they realize that it's a problem. So we anticipate that in the short term, something very good will happen. So thank you for your that, on that. that. that I, sorry, that, that I think AARP's advocacy was very important here. So a lot of legislators submitted bills on this issue, trying yes. to come up with ways to address it. And that is, you know, because they hear from you. And so that's yeah. really important. You know, Representative, it is amazing because, you know, you think about it and yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, we, we need to help those most in need and, and you know, you have to be careful uh, when you're doing these things, you know, do it with a scalpel and so forth. But, you know, again, 75,000, 100,000, you know, if, if you're, you know, it's it's not a lot of money in a state like Connecticut, but it's it's enough when you lose all the relief to say, yeah, you know, maybe South Carolina or Florida is looking pretty good, you know, so it's enough to be able to move and move out of here but it's it's you know what i mean so so there has to be some kind of common ground you're absolutely right um it has to be fair and equitable so i think the approach you're looking at is the way to go and um we, we really do appreciate that so uh now you're also on another committee that we we spend a lot of time on at, at arp and that's the energy and technology committee and um i know you've been on it for for quite some time and uh they've committee has done a lot to try to contain electric rates and deal with uh, affordable high-speed internet. Um, and I know that the, the generation supply portion of electric bills have skyrocketed in January. Um, so what do you think can be done by both ratepayers and the legislature to try to help people keep uh, the lights on? And I know that's a tough question, but, you know, because it's, <laughs> there's only so much you can do, but what, what should people try to do? It, it's a tough question, but it's an important question, right? right? It's really hitting people hard right now across the state. And so we have to focus on what we can do. And I will say that the Energy and Technology Committee is one of those committees that really, they are focused on that work. It is very bipartisan. It's very constructive. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm privileged to work with everybody on that committee. It takes a lot of it's very complicated. And so it takes a lot of time and attention. One of the things that we did um, you know, coming out of tropical storm Isais, which hit all of Connecticut hard, but certainly my community hard, is that we passed a piece of legislation that's known as the Take Back the Grid Act. And one of the things that does is it it tries, starts to move um, the, the ship away from this. We have, just to be simplistic, we have a very sort of too simplistic way of handling our utilities currently, which is that, you know, they have essentially a guaranteed payout. They, they propose certain capital investments, we kind of rubber stamp them and then they get an automatic return on them. And there isn't, we don't give our um, regulatory authority or PURA, Public Utility Regulatory Authority, enough authority to use that, you know, rate payer performance accountability metrics to, to regulate them, to have oversight over them. And so that piece of legislation is starting to move that ship and to give more authority to our regulator, which is run, has excellent leadership right now, that, that she can look at the, the proposals from our electric utilities and say, are you serving the rate payer? Is this in the rate payer's interest? And if not, we're going to hold you accountable for that. And, and we're going to expect you to perform for the benefit of the ratepayer, not always and only for the benefit of the shareholder. I think we have a model currently that, that they are, in terms of their revenue stream, their utility, right? Very stable uh, revenue from people who don't have any choice, can't go anywhere. And then on the, other, on the finance side, they are acting kind of like a you know, completely private business. And, and 
a lot of um, high compensation, a lot of uh, risky financial moves. And so we need to bring those two things in line. You know, if their, their revenue stream is so stable, we ought to be able to have some control over uh, the decisions they make. And it is a slow moving ship. And, and it's, so it's very, it, it takes time, which means that in the interim period, we have to make sure that we provide resources to people who are feeling that pain right now. And to your point, you know, who are really making tough choices between keeping the the power on and, you know, medicine or food or rent, um, you know, all of which are also very expensive in Connecticut. And so we have to make sure that we have enough resources available to keep people safe and healthy uh, and, you know, able to make it to their jobs and take care of their families and get an education, do all the things that people need to do. And so it's a combination of that long-term goal and that immediate need. Yeah. You know, in the Take Back Your Grid Act, one of the uh, components of it that AARP championed and had for many years and were, was glad it was in there was the uh, discount electric rate for a low moderate income folks. And, you know, so we're grateful for that component of it as well. And and I know uh, people are going to be able to start enrolling in that later this year, and it's going to take effect uh, the beginning of next year. So, um, you know, it takes some time, but, the, um, you know, that's going to be something that's going to be very helpful to folks as well. So we, we're very appreciative of that. So, while we're on the uh, issues of before the uh, Energy and Technology Committee, uh, you know, we were, ARP was very pleased and happy to uh, honor your work uh, over the years uh, dealing with the accessible and affordable high-speed internet. I know it's a, a very important issue for your district. You touched uh, on it earlier. And the pandemic really demonstrated how many issues Connecticut has with high-speed internet. Um, and, and you know, you've been fighting to address these for years. I, I could remember when you first got on the committee, you continued the, the good work that was being done by folks like uh, Roberto Willis, uh, who I know uh, pre, pre was one of your predecessors in the committee, and we worked very close with her. So what are some of the ways that the uh, legislature and the uh, uh, governor's office and the various agencies of state government are doing to address this uh, both access and affordability of high-speed internet? Thanks, John. So I first want to thank you for, for the honor that you have given me on this. I feel, you know, it's a little bit, um, this is such a team approach. I have one role, but I have a lot of people in the district who are incredibly knowledgeable and working on helping people at the grassroots. I have other people, you know, in Hertford who are super knowledgeable about the technology, and I'm a piece of that chain. And I'm, you know, working as hard as I can to make all those, you know, links hold together. Right. But there are so many people involved, and so I'm really, I mean, I'm, I'm humbled and, and honored by by um, your your honor. So thank you for that. So one of the things that's happening, of course, at the federal level is that there are significant resources that have been, um, you know, put aside at the federal level for to address broadband. And that's both, um, you know, affordability and infrastructure and everything in between. And the the issue is, you know, how to make sure that that, you know, my region in particular, if you you know, you map sort of actual access, meaning physical infrastructure access and who has it and who doesn't, my region lights up with a bright red light because we are, when, when Connecticut deregulated and no longer required the providers to provide universal coverage, they immediately started making the, you know, econ fiscal economic decisions that, that were not worth it because we have some challenging geography, we're spread out. Uh, and so they, it, it stopped. And so we have been fighting to try to figure out ways to do that. And, and there is there are resources coming in and we're trying to figure out different models of how to make it work in small towns. So, for example, uh, the town of Sharon just uh, finalized an agreement with Comcast who will provide um, full coverage in the entire town of Sharon. Uh, you know, it took a lot of work. There's a lot of long driveways and significant um, geographic challenges there. And Sharon will will put in some money and Comcast will put in some money. And I'm hoping that we can get the, um, you know, as Connecticut stands up its grant system for allocating that federal money, that Sharon's going to be able to participate in that and well. And, and, and I'm hoping that we will have the ability for different towns to create different models, maybe some, you know, a town to create a municipal broadband model, others to partner with, you know, one or, 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 or the other of the incumbents. It's going to take some flexibility and some tenacity. Um, I will say that I'm really 
in awe of uh, you know those in Sharon who have been working on this. Right. You know, both on the ground helping people. You know, a band aid approach. Somebody doesn't have good access, they will go over and try to get a booster or a you know try to figure out what you know talk to the utility and and use leverage by by having us all work together. So it takes many many different approaches uh, in terms of advocacy, legislation, resources, you name it. Uh, but but I think we can make some headway here. That's awesome. And, and yeah, you know, the folks in your district have uh, for years been really at the forefront of uh, trying to solve this issue because, you know, certainly, you know, as you said, your your district is just a, a, an example of lack of accessibility, you know, all and, and then there are some that are served, but they're really underserved when you go to other parts of the state. Yeah. And I think you made that point. The pandemic in particular really um, pointed that out. So we have um, we have a couple of local organizations that have been working on this for years because, of course, our infrastructure deficits are not new. Uh, and my predecessor, Roberta Willis, brought me into this issue when I first ran, and she has been very active in that. And I remember listening to pre-pandemic presentations that they would make trying to convince people that you really need the service. And uh, I, honestly, the response was kind of tepid. People yeah. were, didn't really know that they did. Well, pandemic People are working from home. Kids are studying from home. You need you get your medicine from home. Uh, you know, your every everything is happening through those wires. Uh, and suddenly, people realize that this very weak connection that they had was not really meaningful, and and it didn't work. And so, people's awareness of the of, of you know what they actually need to make their lives work, I think, is much keener now than it was. Well, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, we had been saying it for years. Your, your, you know, folks that uh, you represent have been saying it for years. And it was unfortunate that it was the pandemic that really had to demonstrate to those the powers that be that, hey, you know, we have some serious issues in Connecticut and uh, they need to get addressed because, you know, the, the, the companies that provide had been saying for years, we don't have any issues. Well, because they didn't want to build out in costly places, you know, where there are a lot, there's a lot of territory, but not a lot of people. Right. I mean, but, but, that's not right. And it's an essential service now. And the pandemic proved that. So our next couple of questions, I'm going to turn over to Rich, because uh, uh, these are really important things that uh, our, our members and our volunteers care about. So Rich, why don't uh, you take it from here? Okay, be happy to. Well, thank you so much for all your comments. We really appreciate them. And uh, not to put you on the spot, but could you tell us uh, something about the priorities for the next legislative session? Some of your sure. priorities, so yeah. Yeah, I don't. You, it's you're allowed to put me on the spot. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I mean, I will say so. To, just to go back to the, you know, I chairing the finance committee. I, I, I take that's my that that's now the structural, the sort of lens through which I, I view everything because I want to have, you know, a responsible, fair uh, system in which you know we can fund the the necessary services in Connecticut with sustainability. So what I'd like to do, and that's this year, but also in the future. Is, is to do things that we can continue, people can have confidence that we can continue to provide, that we're not seesawing, you know, one year to the next, we're gonna toss you this, this year, but don't count on it next year. I'd like to, that's, that's hard on individuals, families, businesses, you name it. And so I'd like to try to, as much as possible to have a steady hand that people can rely on going into the future. Um, and then my own priorities I, I have, you know, are, are driven in part by my district and the committees that I sit on. So rural health care, for example, um, we have, you know, rural health care is experiencing challenges throughout the country. And we have a version of it in my district with a small hospital, Sharon Hospital, which is part of a larger um uh, group. And, and I, you know, understand, you know, there have just been some numbers that come out recently about our hospital systems in Connecticut are, are challenged. And I think across the country and all kinds of reasons, they have workforce challenges. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're under some stress. And, um, but the answer cannot be, I fear that when, you know, there is some sort of stress, and you have a system, they pull back from the areas that are more expensive in which to deliver services. So related to our conversation about broadband, that's also true for healthcare. It's true for almost everything in a rural area. It's just more expensive to provide those services often. And, mm -hmm. and so I think the state has an obligation to, to step in and, uh, and acknowledge that and either provide some, some support or 
you know, regulatory help, something to make sure that the answer isn't just to withdraw from rural areas because I can't, so we had a lot of people of all ages um, uh, move into my district during the pandemic, but they're not gonna stay if they don't feel like they have access to reliable quality healthcare. Um, same is true for broadband, by the way, but yeah. um, we need to make sure that those, we can support those, those organizations so that they will, again, steadily, reliably be there and be able to provide a high quality service into the future. So I'm very interested in that. Uh, we just were in the process of, of opening a federally qualified health center in North Canaan, which I'm very proud of getting uh, bonding support for. Um, and I've looked at other rural healthcare models that I've looked at in, you know, in near, we're very close to both New York and Massachusetts. They always are hospital systems working in combination with an FQHC. And so I think that has potential to help us. Um, so that's a big issue that's important to me. Uh, I also sit on the environment committee. So those are, you know, some immediate concerns of, you know, uh, preservation of land and keeping our water clean and, and, uh, and make sure that people have access to, I think that's another thing that the pandemic taught us, how important it is to have access to the outdoors, uh, mm -hmm. to be able to get outside and go for a walk in the woods. Um, but also the long-term, of course, you know, the climate, uh, making sure that we can maintain uh, a, an envir a healthy environment for all of us into the future is, is really important. So those are kind of big picture, long-term interests for me. Okay, great. Thank you so much. It sounds like we're on, on the right road here. I was very impressed by almost every comment you made today. You mentioned the people in your community. And, you know, many of the AARP volunteers have testified before the General Assembly in the past and will continue to do so in the future. But can you give us a little insight uh, as to what you think people in the community can do to stay more informed and work with the General Assembly when you're in session and when you're not in session. It's it's an excellent. Thank you so much for asking that. So first, I hope I hope they read my newsletter. <laughs> I okay. put a newsletter out every week, and I I do a Facebook Live conversation in connection with it, just to try to keep connected to people. In a okay. district as big as mine, it's hard to see everybody in person on a regular basis. So uh, it's a way for me to kind of feel like I have a, a regular conversation going on with the district. Um, testifying is really important and and I have just you know we're we're working through the end of the the public hearings in in the, the legislative session this year and so I've been sitting through a lot of long public hearings and what is really you know impactful is when people testify you know you know show up I mean you know individuals show up and testify about their own personal experiences about how a policy affects them and their family and their neighbors. That is really powerful. And I have, you know, with colleagues sort of had a text stream going on, you know, did you hear that, you know, that retired fisherman talking about this, this, you know, his, his, yeah. you know, multi-generational business and about how, what, what we're proposing to do might really ruin it for him and his family, you know, and did you hear, that's really powerful. And we, it, it, you know, we're listening and it really makes a difference. And I will say that particularly, you know, for us in the Northwest corner, having a virtual option is critical, you know, as, as I'm, it is for other parts of the state, because you no longer have to come into Hartford and um, spend the day here. You can, you you know, take care of your families, do your job, uh, you know, cook dinner, uh, and also testify. And so it's critically important. But I will also add that it is important for those of you who can make it to here, um, you know, having particularly, you know, when we're in session, having, you know, the, the recognizable AARP uh, logo <laughs> present in the Capitol. Very good. Yes, that makes Red a shirts. difference. You know, know that you're watching and, and, yeah, yeah. and you're going to ask us why we vote in a certain way and hold us accountable for that. That's really important. And, and it's, you know, to get people, you know, to really, it, it is, I can't underestimate how important it is for, to make sure that you, you know, have your voices be heard. Not, you know, your lobbyist is excellent, <laughs> but also, um, <laughs> but also individuals, it makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful for us when we walk into a, a hearing, you know, a dozen of us walk in in the chair, uh, calls us out and welcomes us and greets us and everything. And, uh, you know, we get to meet a lot of the senators and representatives and have personal relationships with them. And it goes an awfully long way when we want to ask a favor or they want to ask a favor of us. So it's a two-way street. 
Representative, thank you so much. Appreciate your being with us today. Thank, yeah. thank you for 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 doing this this morning. Yeah. So that uh, brings us to the close of another edition of Coffee and Tea. I want to thank our very special guests, both our volunteer, Rich Bright, and uh, State Representative Maria Horn. Uh, we appreciate you being with us this morning. So uh, be sure to tune in with us again next time for another edition of Coffee and Tea with AARP Connecticut. Thank you.